In December 21st, 1991, investigators obtained a search warrant to search the backyard, hoping to find a woman who had been missing. The property itself is a four acre piece of, of land with a house on it and a ravine behind the property. One section in the ravine was filled in. From an investigator's standpoint, you'd look at that and say, why would someone fill in just one 20-foot section of a ravine that's a natural runoff for water? Didn't really make a lot of sense. The backhoe operator was able to dig a hole down there, probably 8 to 10 feet deep. He found a portion of the chain link fence down in the hole. It had been basically nailed into the ground with two wooden stakes so it wouldn't wash away if there was ever any flood. As detectives step in for a closer look at their strange discovery, they spot something beneath the chain link fence that looks like a blanket. A sheriff's detective pulled out a knife and dug around the cloth material found in the hole. She felt a bone. Our forensic anthropologist was able to determine that it was a knee bone. The detectives believe their gruesome discovery may finally end a dark mystery that has pained a family for four years. The only identifying thing on the body itself was the clothing, but I was confident it was our missing person. When you find a body in the backyard, you, you need to know who it is, but you're also wanting to know how this person died. What was it that led to them being buried so unceremoniously like this? It's not every day in San Diego County that you find somebody buried in the backyard. On a bright and warm summer morning, the San Diego Sheriff's Department receives a frantic 911 call from Leonard Eddington. He had seen Vicky's car by the side of the road with a flat tire. The car was approximately four miles from their home on Highway 94. And he saw this as he was taking his children to swim class. He actually was calling to report her missing. Leonard stated that he had dropped the children off at the YMCA in La Mesa. He said he signed them in at 8.02 that morning. From there, he drove back uh, to the car, took a closer look at it, and saw uh, the flat tire. And Leonard called Vicky's first job, the hospital. They indicated that she had not shown up for work that evening. He said he also called Colorspan, Vicky's second job. And likewise, uh, they had not seen her that day. The sheriff's office dispatches deputies to Leonard's home. And he provides as many details as he can about Vicky's movements the previous day. He said the night that she disappeared, her mother was supposed to come over and take care of the kids while she went off to her night job. And her mother couldn't make it. So Leonard stepped in. He came over to her house, walked out to her car, and that's the last he saw her. As the family prays for Vicky's safe return home, police extend their investigation beyond the immediate area where her car was found. It quickly results in a promising lead. From the clerk at a convenience store two miles up the road from Vicky's abandoned car. The worker indicated that a female came into a store that evening complaining that she had received a flat tire, that she had $20 and she wanted change to make a call for somebody to come help her. He was shown a photograph of Vicki Addington and asked if that was the person that came to the store. And he said that he thought it was her, it looked like her. At that point, he gave her a uh, change and she went off and he didn't see where she went. And he just assumed that she went to make a phone call. Because it was hard to believe that she had just taken off, it led to kind of an assumption that something really bad had happened to her, the possibility involving some stranger. 
my thought was that after she left the convenience store, presumably walking back to her car, that somebody stopped and either picked her up or forcibly picked her up. The next question would come to mind would be, who would she have called to help her? And also, if she was there that night, where is she now? So at the time, in 1988, everybody was writing articles about Vicki Eddington all the way up and down California. And what the articles are starting to focus on is on Leonard. There were reports of when he was being questioned of him perspiring and acting very manically and strangely. So in 1988, I started reporting that story that Leonard filed a lawsuit to try to get back the vehicle which was still in police custody. There were a lot of reasons that detectives did not want to let it go, to let it go to him. They were concerned that he was going to fix whatever evidence was there of any tampering and whatnot. And there was apparently some evidence about work that he had been doing in the area where the spare tire was kept. And as part of reporting that story, I reached out to Leonard. I left a voicemail with him. And I was really surprised to come home one day from work and find a voicemail on my personal phone from Leonard saying, back off. I don't want you involved in this story whatsoever. I don't remember the exact words, but I know the feeling that I had, and the feeling was one of having been threatened to avoid this story at all costs. I felt like I wanted to back off the story, but I, I'm a journalist. I had to go forward and, and report it to try to find out exactly what happened to Vicki Eddington. During that four-year period after Vicki's disappearance, there were reported sightings of Vicki in different places like Mexico and different states. She was supposedly seen in the Pacific Northwest. So we did hear that Leonard and his mother went in together to hire a detective because they thought they had sightings of Vicki at her family's house, her parents' house, and they wanted to prove that she was still alive. We had the private detective come within a few days of her disappearing and speak with us. They had been watching our house and heard that we had had a dark-haired girl staying with us in Tacoma, and they thought maybe that might be Vicki. But what we had was a, a Japanese exchange student staying with us, and that's who that was. But they came and thoroughly investigated and checked out the home and everything, and trying to find some validity to Leonard's story, and there, there was nothing there. At that point, I was still trying to be open-minded and let it play out. We were just waiting to find Vicki. Early on, after the search warrant was executed, we searched the house. They were able to find Lenny's little black book. It contained mostly female friends, girlfriends. We obviously wanted to talk to many of them, find out what they knew or would say, what uh, Leonard Eddington's story to them was about what had happened to Vicki Eddington. At the outset, they were hesitant to talk to us. These were middle-class, nice, single women who were looking for a man in their life. And they responded to his ads in the newspapers. They did not know that he was seeing multiple women at the same time. They thought they were the ones. They didn't know he was still married. They didn't know he was seeing other women. Ultimately, when we had the preliminary hearing, I subpoenaed many of them to court. And before they got to court, they came to our office in the district attorney's office in a waiting room. And I put them all in the same room, didn't tell anybody who anybody was, and let them sit. Eventually, they caught on that these were all of Lenny's women. And I remember one individual saying, well, I was the one that Lenny asked to come over and water the plants or feed the dog or do something 
while he was gone. Yeah, well, I was the one that he was gone with. And once they figured out who they were and what he had done, not only to his wife, Vicki, but to them, we were able to get a great deal of information from them at that point.